pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. And we pray this morning that through your word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are filled to overflowing with the love of Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. For those who are just joining us today, we are been, we've been in a series in Acts. And the title of the series is Living Your Faith in Light of the Resurrection. It's actually part five. Forgot to change the slide on that one. So I'm just making sure I've got the other slides in order, making sure I've got the right PowerPoint there. But uh, today, you know, people say, Is there ever, was there ever an ideal church? Maybe not a perfect church, but an ideal church. And indeed, there was. In Acts, we find the ideal church, Acts chapter 4. Not perfect, because there's, the church is only going to be perfect on the other side, in heaven. But on this side, it was probably as close to ideal as one could get. What you would find is that there was unity within the church. True unity. There was the loving of Christ Jesus, and thus there was caring and sharing of resources for one another. And there was also, therefore, powerful testimony of Jesus, the risen Lord and Savior. Now, because of this ideal church, the unity, the love, the care, the sharing, the proclamation of Jesus, well, you know who hates that, right? Satan. And so there was an attack on the church. We've seen Satan be, attack the church from the outside, but now we're going to see the attack from the inside. So today, let us learn, first of all, what we can do as striving towards that ideal, but also then protecting ourselves against the attack from Satan. So we are going to start with the ideal church, Acts chapter 4. Verse 32, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any, and, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So the first thing that we find here is that there is a unity a unity of heart and soul. And when I talk about unity of heart and soul, I'm talking about the depth, the breadth, the very essence, that there was harmony among all of the believers. Can you imagine that? Harmony among all of the believers. This doesn't mean that there weren't individual personalities and different thoughts and so forth, but there was actual unity and harmony. So the question is, what makes for that unity, what makes for that harmony? And there's really only one answer for this. The answer for that unity is through the love of Jesus Christ. They were filled with who He is, a love of, a love for Him, knowing Him as Lord and Savior, and the wonderful gift that he gave us in salvation, the forgiveness of sin, they were just filled with that love and that gratitude. That, that and that alone is the foundation of Christian unity. Jesus and the love for him has to be that foundation. This is why Paul would write in Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to, it's on screen, but I'm going to start a little before then. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with the power through, the whole, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
There's that, that dwelling, the fullness of God that overflowed in them. We also find this in 1 John, that fellowship, that unity. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now look, that unity comes from within. There are a lot of churches that try to create unity from the outside. And thus they have a lot of programs, they have a lot of activities, and they try to create unity through that. Now by the way, having programs, having, having uh, uh, activities where there's fellowship, that's a good thing. I, that's, that's not bad at all. It's a good thing to have that. We need that. But that's not what creates the actual unity. Now, on the other side, there are some churches that say we are going to demand unity by having you follow all of the particular rules that we have. It becomes legalistic. And legalism doesn't actually create unity. It simply creates conformity. What creates Christian unity? It is the love of Jesus. So true Christian fellowship, true Christian unity comes not from the outside, but by being filled from within with the love of Jesus. And this happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't force someone, I can't force anyone to be filled with the love of Christ. But I can encourage and I can pray for the Holy Spirit to be at work in that person. Because it was at Pentecost that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And they were proclaiming Christ Jesus. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, more and more people came to believe. So, do we share? Of course we do. But it is always through the power of the Holy Spirit, that people are then filled with the love of Christ. And when you have the love of Christ, you have the love of God. And this is what God said all the way back in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. And these words I command to you shall be on your heart. Look, the believers right then and there were of one heart and soul. The love of Christ, the love of God. And because they were filled with the love of Christ, what spills over then is for love of one another. And this also then fulfills the greatest, the second greatest of the commandments from Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not only unity but it is love for one another that is the hallmark of a healthy church. So let's just go back to the text again. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Before we get into the text, I have to address something that... Uh, how this text has been twisted and abused. They had everything in common. There are people who would say that this proves that the church was socialist or communist. I don't know if you ever heard that before. But they have a very naive viewpoint of socialism and communism, and they overlay that. They read into the text those ideologies. And at the best, it's a naive understanding of socialism and communism. At worst, it is blind foolishness. Because when you take a look at socialism and communism, socialism and communism, all the experiments that have been done in this world they all end up in tyranny. As one commentator put it, all of these experiments ended up with a strong central government ruled by a few who control the means of production, the political process, the media, and the profit from the labor of many. 
as the saying goes, power cor- corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what you find in these. But that's not what happened in Acts. There was no dictate that you must do these things. It was done voluntarily. Look, communism says, what's yours is mine. Christianity says, what's mine is yours. You see, Christianity is grounded in the love of God and then the love for one another. And sharing comes from caring and loving other people. Really, that's where it comes from. Sharing flows from caring for one another. God also says this is how it's supposed to be anyway. That we are to love one another. Deuteronomy chapter 15 from our reading today. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your lands that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. That's the ideal church where we give, where we share, because we care for one another, because we love one another. And I love that's what we do here at Joy Church. We care and love for one another, and thus we do share on a voluntary basis. It's voluntary. There's no demand that you must, but people do because of love. So in our text, verse 34 through 37, there was not a needy person among them. For as many were as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So think about this. By this time, there's at least, at least 10,000 or more, probably anywhere between 15 and 20,000 believers at this time. That's almost the size, well, actually in the summer, it is the size of Fountain Hills, right? That's a pretty big group, right? And so they would have ample resources to be able to share with one another. And they encouraged one another, loving one another by doing so. And here Barnabas is introduced. Uh, Luke tells us his name was son of encouragement, and he really was an encourager. If you take a look at Barnabas, he played an important role in Acts. So we see that even Barnabas had sold on land. Luke just gives him as an example of one who took the proceeds, sold a field, and then laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I want to talk about laying at the apostles' feet because we don't have that in our culture, right? And when we start to think about that, we think, are they paying homage to the apostles, right? Were the apostles being high and mighty? And the answer is no. They really weren't paying homage to the apostles. They were simply putting at the feet of those who were going to help disperse and help the needs of others. It would be like if you put it in an offering plate. It's not that you're offering it to me whatsoever. I wouldn't want, you know, that's not it. You give it to the church to be used for the resources of this ministry. Same thing. As a matter of fact, when you take a look at the apostles, they didn't want this administrative activity at all. They, later on, they talk about, we need to be preaching and teaching. That's what we were called to do. So there's unity, there's caring and sharing, loving one another, and then the preaching or the testimony of Jesus. These are marks of a healthy church. It says, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great 
grace was upon them. Now, last week we talked about boldness, right? They were bold in their witness of Jesus. And we talked about boldness, that bravery or courage really comes from trust, from confidence, from assurance of knowing who Jesus is, that he is Lord and Savior, that he suffered, died, and rose again, and that he has ascended into heaven. They had the assurance of good news that they were truly, truly forgiven in him. And they had the promise of eternal life in him. And it was real. And the good news filled them so much that they could not contain themselves. And thus, you could say, because they couldn't contain themselves, they were bold. Now, I know all of you at one point have been bold. Maybe not in your witness for Jesus yet. But I bet you've been bold. For example, let me give you a simple and silly example. How many of you have seen a movie that you really liked? That you really liked? And that you started to tell other people about it? As a matter of fact, even if your conversation wasn't about the movie, you brought it up. Oh, I, you got to go see this movie, right? I, come on, you're all like, oh... You've done something like that before. You've told somebody about something because it excited you, it moved you, and you wanted to share that excitement with others. Some could say you were even bold, right? Now, movies are fictitious. I think documentaries, sometimes even documentaries can be fictitious. But is Jesus fictitious? No, he's not. Is the good news a reality? Yeah, it is. Does it need to be shared with others? Yes, it does. Because when you sit with the gospel long enough, it fills you. It just fills you and it starts to spill out. That's what they were doing. They were sharing the good news because they could not not share the good news. You see, the mark of a healthy church is being so filled with the good news that it must be shared. Not because there's a dictate. Not because we're trying to get how many people in the pews. But because it is good news. Period. Now, I will try to be like Barnabas and be a son of encouragement as much as I can. But ultimately, it has to be through the power of the Holy Spirit because when the apostles were sharing the good news, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony. Now, I want to be clear. This was not about eloquence of speech or rhetoric or oratory skills. It wasn't about any of that. That's not the power they had. It was about the power of the Holy Spirit working through them and sometimes perhaps even in spite of them. So I gave an example about a year ago and I want to bring it up again because I think it fits really well here. It's a true story. There was a pastor who was at a uh, Christian junior high camp. Okay? Okay. So there was a a youth camp for junior high students, and this pastor served there. And one boy who was there had spastic paralysis. He was the object of ridicule. You know how good junior high students can be sometimes, right? When he would ask a question, when this boy would ask a question, the other boys would deliberately answer in a halting, mimicking way. They were mocking that young boy. And one night, his cabin group chose him to lead the devotions for the entire camp. It was one, of, one more effort to have some fun at his expense. But unashamedly, 
the spastic boy stood up and he strained and slurred his words, each word coming with great effort. He simply said, Jesus loves me and I love Jesus. That was all. And conviction came upon everyone in that camp. Many were moved to tears. Some of the men, the young boys, eventually went into ministry because of what that one young boy said. Now, was it an eloquent speech? Was it well-crafted with rhetoric, oratory skills? We would say no, looking at it from the outside, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, it was eloquent. It was perfectly crafted. It was powerful. And God's grace was upon that group then. His favor was shown upon that boy and all who heard. And so many came to faith that day. It's the same with the apostles. Look, they were uneducated, right? They were uneducated. They didn't go to school. They didn't go to seminary. None of that. They were fishermen and other tradesmen. And yet the Holy Spirit work through them so that others would come to know Jesus. That's the power of their testimony. And you know, quite frankly, I often feel more like that spastic boy than I do a pastor or preacher out in the world. And I pray for opportunities I pray for that boldness, but more than anything, it's praying for the Holy Spirit to work through me, to use me as He will to lead others to Jesus. The powerful testimony. So here, can you hear how ideal this church is? Wouldn't you like to be in a church like that? Right? And this is what we're striving for. In a church like that, there was unity of heart and soul. There was caring for one another through sharing, and there was powerful testimony of Jesus. Now, if any church is going well like that, who hates it? Satan. Satan hates it. And Satan had been attacking the church from the outside. There had been persecution from the outside. And now Satan would change his attack and bring it from the inside. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds he, brought, he bought and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young man rose and wrapped him and carried him out and buried him. So let's be clear, first of all about what the sin is and what the sin is not. Let's start with what the sin is not. The sin is not owing, owning anything. The sin is not selling something. The sin is not even keeping the proceeds of what you sell. None of that is actual sin. You can own things. You can sell things. You can keep the proceeds. That is up to your discretion. God has given you the freedom in that regard. And it's not even about the amount of money. It's not about $1 or $100 or a $1 million. None of that is sin. So what is the sin here? The sin is really hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is pretending to be 
virtuous. You know, wanting to look good to others, especially religious hypocrisy. Oh, look how much I've donated to the church. Look how much I volunteered at the church. All of that. Sometimes, by the way, we call hypocrisy being two-faced. It's because it's associated, the word is associated with Greek actors who wore masks during their plays. Hypocrisy, being two-faced. But the truth about hypocrisy is that it is all a lie. It's a falsehood designed to deceive, to fool others. By the way, I want to distinguish something here between hypocrisy and failure. People who are hypocrites, they don't even believe what they're saying. But there are many people who do believe what they say and profess and fail. We call those sinners, right? Who are saved by grace. So the church is full of people who have failed and continue to fail. But what's the difference? The difference is, yes, we have a particular standard. God's standard, right? Not ours, but God's. And we strive towards that. And we fail. But we are hit with remorse. Regret. We confess our sins. And we come before the Lord and say, here are my sins, please forgive me. We come to the cross and we pray to be sanctified, to be cleansed, to be renewed again. So the church, the body, is made up of sinners who fail and come to the cross all the time. That's different than being a hypocrite. See, a hypocrite doesn't actually believe what they say. At the heart of any hypocrisy is a lie. And not just to man, but to God. So within the church, you do find hypocrites. Now hold on, you might be saying, hypocrites, how could, if if we're a body of believers, how could there be hypocrites in the church? Well, Jesus actually warned people about that. He gave a parable about the tares, the, the weeds and the wheat, the tares and the wheat. And he said, the Son of Man has sown much good seed, and yet who seeds, who, who sows the bad seeds? It's the devil. It's Satan. So even within the church, there will be hypocrites. There will be the tares. And again, this sin is not against other Christians, although it could be. But ultimately, it is against God himself. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? You have not lied to man, but to God. By the way, notice here, when he says you lied to the Holy Spirit and then you lied to God, he's equating the Holy Spirit to God. God, the Holy Spirit. So Ananias is a religious hypocrite. A religious hypocrite is one that God despises because they mock God. If you want to read chapter 23 of Matthew, I would encourage you to do so. If you think Jesus always just said really nice things, read chapter 23. I'm going to read just uh, two verses for you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. God hates hypocrites, but 
especially religious hypocrites. So Peter recognizes this. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he has insight, spiritual insight into what has happened with Ananias. And I want you to notice, he does not tell Ananias, woe to you, God strike you, God smite you dead now. He doesn't do any of that, does he? He just said, why have you lied to God? And Ananias falls dead at his feet. We don't know exactly why, how, but the hand of God was in this. And they understood that. Great fear came upon them. The hand of God was upon this church and upon Ananias. And then a little bit later, his wife comes in and pretty much the same story, right? And she falls dead as well. Now, you might be thinking, doesn't this seem out of place? I mean, this account, right? It's uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. But there are times, there are times that God will purify his church. By the way, if you don't think that'll happen, again, just read Revelation. <laughs> we went all the way through that. God will purify his church. Because who is the church? The church is the bride of Christ. And we see this in Revelation so beautifully, the marriage supper of the Lamb and the bride. And as the bride, she is to be spotless. So imagine. Imagine what you would do if you husbands, newly married, newly married, and you are living the honeymoon life, and all of a sudden, an intruder breaks into your home and would take advantage of your wife to desecrate her. Husbands, would you go to any length to protect your bride? You would, wouldn't you? And mothers, if you had children who are a young age, and there was a predator coming into your home to do harm to your children, you would stop at nothing to protect your children, right? We are the bride of Christ. God will expel what is unholy to protect what He has declared to be holy, to be set aside. That is our God who loves His church, the bride of Christ. Okay, so how do we apply all of this, right? Because it's a lot. How do we apply all of this? Well, look, the natural tendency is to focus first on the negative, right? To root out any hypocrisy within the church body. And you get a lot of, lot of churches that can become very legalistic about this. And you know what? It is true. We, we should not allow hypocrisy within the church. But the best way is to not let Satan keep a, get a foothold in the first place. So rather than trying to empty something, let's fill it up instead. Let's look to the ideal church. So we should focus on being filled with the love of Jesus, of being his follower, right? Of just sitting, maybe it's just sitting, and just knowing how much he loves you and what he has done for you. And let your heart be filled with gratitude. Turn off the news this week, right? You want to empty your cup of gratitude? Listen to the news. You want to be filled with gratitude? Go to Christ, the cross, and his word. And then the second is, uh, once that spills over, love one another. Really. Really. Continue to grow in loving of one another, of sharing, caring, doing for the other. And then be filled with the good news. Really, is it, is it good news? 
I mean, that's what the gospel means. But is it good news? Is it better than any movie I've ever seen? And maybe, just maybe, the Holy Spirit then will work in you, right? Pray for the Holy Spirit to give you that boldness and opportunities to tell another, come and see, come and see. And that's the good news for today. And all the people said, amen.